Thank you. Thank you for having me. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Maybe yes. Someone can just confirm. The screen, okay, is still, is, the screen is still not, I can't see the screen for some reason. Oh, you cannot see it? No. Um, okay, let me see what I can do here. Uh, it says that I'm sharing, and I see it in mine. I see it as one of the participants. Um, or maybe I can... Uh, maybe you can reshare it again, please. If I do that, that does that help? I've pinned it. Okay, I'll stop sharing and I'll share it again. Yes, please. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, it's presenting now. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about principles and practice of software forensics. So there's me. Uh, I think you've already heard everything you need to hear about me. Uh, I'll mention that I created this field about uh, 20 years ago. And the agenda is I'm going to talk about US copyright law, uh, US trade secret law, uh, defining source code, what is source code correlation, uh, what is source code cross-correlation, what is object code correlation, and what is a software clean room. Uh, just uh, so this seems to be going on its own. Uh, I don't know why. Let me... Um, <laughs> so I'm... Okay, but I'm going to talk about U.S. copyright law. Uh, again, I don't know why this is going on its own, but I'm... Okay, I'll deal with this. So U.S. copyright... Uh, so I, I'm mostly familiar with U.S. law. A lot of laws around the world are similar, but uh, and I have worked in cases around the world. So I think this should be relevant to everyone. So U.S. copyright law is a form of protection for published and unpublished works that give certain exclusive rights. I want to mention published and unpublished. The United States, up until some time ago, was uh, uh, actually different than the rest of the world. There was a treaty, I think in the 1970s, that brought the United States in line with the rest of the world. It used to be that in the US, you had to have published a work for it to be protected by copyright. Uh, but the rest of the world uh, said it doesn't matter if it's published or not. And, the, and having published and unpublished works helps with software because there's some question about what does it mean to publish software. Uh, but now, to be clear, even if the work is not published, when it's complete, or at least mostly complete, it's considered to have a copyright, and there's no need to, cop to register that copyright with any government office. Uh, you need to do that in the United States to sue someone, to bring litigation, but it's, you know, people are not often clear that even if it's not published, you have a, a, a copyright in that work. And the exclusive rights are to reproduce the work, to prepare derivative works. This is particularly important for software. So if someone creates some software and then someone else uh, creates something based on that software, they need that copy, they need the, the, uh, uh, the permission of the copyright holder. To distribute copies of the work, to perform the work publicly, that doesn't necessarily have to do with software, to display the work publicly, again, not necessarily having to do with software. These things cover things like writing, novels, books, music, television shows. There's a special section of rights for sound recordings, which again, don't, don't apply to software. But to infringe a copyright is anyone who violates any of the exclusive rights of the copyright owner without permission. In other words, anyone who performs any of those activities without the permission of the uh, owner of the copyright. So uh, now I'm going to talk about US trade secret law. And US trade secret law depends on the uh, specific jurisdiction. So for example, every state in the United States, all 50 states, have slightly different laws about trade secrets. And a few years ago, the United States created a federal law for trade secrets. 
but all of them are essentially the same. And all of them require th something to have, to meet three criteria, three factors to, in order to be considered a trade secret. One of those is it's secret. That seems pretty obvious, hopefully, but it's not generally known. Now, there are some variations. Something can, for example, if somebody uh, posts some algorithm or some, you know, some, some kind of proprietary knowledge to the internet, and it's on one page somewhere on the internet, uh, some jurisdictions will say that's no longer a trade secret because it's not secret. But other jurisdictions say it's so difficult to find that it's still considered a trade secret. It must have some economic benefit to the holder of the trade secret. So famous trade secrets, for example, the formula for Coca-Cola is a famous trade secret. And Coca-Cola has to show that the formula for the, for the soda, you know, which ingredients it has and how to create Coca-Cola has some economic benefit to Coca-Cola, to the company Coca-Cola, which I think is pretty obvious in the case of Coca-Cola that people drink it because it tastes a certain way. Uh, in other cases, it becomes more difficult just because you keep something secret doesn't mean it's a trade secret unless it has some benefit to you. And then you have to go through reasonable efforts to maintain the secrecy, which means typically that you have, that your employee, the employees of a company will sign a non-disclosure agreement when they become an employee, uh, that you don't give out the software code. If you have a partnership with another company that you sign an agreement that that anything you share is to remain secret. So these are the three factors that go into whether something is a trade secret. So what is a software trade secret? Well, a software trade secret is basically plagiarism, well, trade secret theft, I should say. What is trade secret theft? Plagiarism or copying of any secret valuable code. Uh, there we go. Plagiarism of secret valuable code, copying of secret valuable code, copying or modifying secret valuable code. Some programmers don't understand that uh, if you take something and modify it, the fact that you took it in the first place, unless you had the permission to do that, it's still trade secret theft. Using something as a reference. Basically, getting your hands on any kind of code, any kind of useful code, is generally going to be trade secret theft if you don't have permission to use that code for whatever purpose you're using it for. But it's also the copying of any secret valuable concept. So in addition to software source code being a trade secret, most software source code, if it's proprietary to the company, if it was developed at the company, unless the company specifically releases that code to the public, that's going to be a trade secret. Uh, any kind of algorithms within the code. So if someone copies an algorithm, but not the code itself, that's probably trade secret theft. Uh, any kind of test procedures. But then also things like customer lists, business plans, product pricing. Uh, basically anything that gives you a competitive advantage that you keep secret is a trade secret. And anyone who takes that or utilizes it in any way whatsoever, uh, that comprises trade secret theft. So now if we talk about plagiarism, uh, because trade plagiarism, the copying of code without, a th without authorization, can be copyright infringement and it can be trade secret theft. Usually lawyers decide which law works better for them depending on where they are and uh, what the circumstances are. Uh, but it's, you know, Plagiarism has become a, a growing problem. Uh, part of it because the internet makes access to code so easy. Search engines makes, ac makes access to code very easy. The open source movement, in my opinion, has contributed to the copying of code because a lot of programmers don't understand what the limits are. Because so much code is given out for free, uh, a lot of programmers have the idea that code isn't valuable but it's the owner who has to give it out for free. You can't go take your employer's code, for example. And then the other thing is software has become so valuable over the years, it keeps increasing in value that uh, there's an incentive for copying code. 
So what I'd like to do is go back to the history of what's, what was called plagiarism measurement or plagiarism detection. And these are terms that I don't like, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a, in a few slides from now. But we can go back to 1977. There was a gentleman named uh, Halstead, and he published a book called Elements of Software Science, where he defined ways of measuring software. This may have been the first effort to measure software in some way, other than lines of code, something more sophisticated. And so he created these values where he measured the number of operators, operands, things like that. Then he created a number called V, the volume of a program, and E, the mental effort required for the program. I, I think this was interesting. It's not used anymore at all that I'm aware of. It was used to compare programs. If programs had the same volume or mental effort, there was a suspicion that one was copied from the other. But my take on this is that it really had no grounding. It had no basis. These were fairly arbitrary measurements. And I think people realized that they weren't good, really good measures of software and certainly not good measures of whether software was copied. Then came Faidi and Robinson. These are two researchers who published a paper called An Empirical Approach for Detecting Program Similarity and Plagiarism with a, in a University Programming Environment. And they created what they called the six levels of program modification. And this chart shows you those six levels. And you can see it starts out in the middle with no changes. And there's an arrow going outward uh, that has to do with changing comments, changing identifiers, changing variable position. And they called this the levels of modification and each level was more, uh, was, was more significant than the one before it. So one of my issues with this is that really, how do you determine that one is more significant or what does it mean for one to be more significant? And what if you do combinations of these things? So then uh, after that, there was uh, Jankowitz was a professor who published this algorithm for detecting plagiarism in Pascal programs. And you can see this flow chart. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. Interestingly enough, I've been doing my work for about 20 years. And the, for the very first time that I can recall, I noticed that this chart actually says high correlation on it. It, it talks about correlation. I hadn't noticed before that someone else in this field had used the term correlation, but it's not clear what he means by that. Sorry, let me, uh, there we go. <clears throat> and then the most recent, I, I'm, not <clears throat> I'm not describing all of the plagiarism detection programs, but one of the more significant ones is the measure of software similarity called MOS, developed by Professor Alex Aiken. He was at Berkeley, and then he moved over to Stanford, my alma mater. Uh, and his program for measuring software similarity used what he called a winnowing algorithm, which would basically have a sliding window uh, that, would, that would look at characters, let's say, uh, you know, it has a length of K, so if K is 12, it would look at 12 characters at a time. It would, it would create a hash of those 12 characters. <coughs> and in that way, he would create a fingerprint. He would look at, he would slide this window along the code and create what he called a fingerprint. And then programs that had the same fingerprint would be identified as plagiarized or similar fingerprints. Uh, and and his program treats uh, his his MOS program his MOS application treats software like a text document. Uh, it didn't matter, you know, what whether it was a software code or some other kind of text, really. So, okay. But the first problem I had with this field is I don't like the word plagiarism. Because if you look at a dictionary, plagiarism is the unauthorized use or close imitation of somebody else's work. And the problem is, the key is unauthorized. None of these tools determine whether code was 
that was copied was authorized or unauthorized. So in other words, it's not really detecting plagiarism. So I stayed away from the term plagiarism. It, it gives a meaning that uh, and an implication about the, the copier's state of mind and, and legal issues that have nothing to do with what these tools are looking at. And you'll see this is from uh, Jankowitz's uh, flowchart. The last, the last uh, piece of the flowcharts is plagiarism detected. And all of these tools claim to detect plagiarism, but really none of them are detecting plagiarism. They're detecting similarity. So I don't like that part of what was done before. There was no definition of what does it mean to copy code? What does it mean to plagiarize? There were no uh, references, there were no standards. Standards are a problem. What if one program says something was copied and another program says it wasn't copied? And there was no theoretical basis for why these tools work. People just did them and said, oh, it looks like it works. And they often reflected the creator's bias. Uh, so for example, some tools didn't even look at comments. And in copyright infringement, uh, comments, copying comments can be copyright infringement, probably not trade secret theft because a comment doesn't have any value to the program. But it certainly can be a sign that a program was copied. And most of these, until I created my tools, most of these other tools and algorithms just ignored comments altogether. So I figured we needed an all-encompassing metric. And the first thing we needed to do was define source code in a way that was useful for detecting copying. <laughs> Okay, so here is my, again, for some reason my program's going, my, my slides are going on their own, but uh, here we show an example of how we define source code. So we all know that source code is the human readable code that uh, a programmer writes. It goes into a compiler program and comes out as what's called either machine code, object code, executable code, binary code, but basically the ones and zeros that the computer executes. What I did is I looked at a way of dividing them up, dividing source code into elements that were useful for finding, for eventually determining whether copying had occurred. So there are statements that cause actions. Uh, and there are comments and strings, both of which are really non-functional in the sense that they don't change how the computer operates. Comments are intended for other programmers to look at in the code and determine uh, you know, to document the program, how it's working. Strings are messages to the user, error messages, instructions to the user. And then statements can be further divided into instructions and identifiers, and those can be further divided. And, well, here's an example. Uh, on the left is a small uh, C++ program. And then I've color coded it so you can see how it's divided into statements, comments, and strings, how statements are further divided into instructions and identifiers, and those instructions and identifiers are further divided. And then what I did is I came up with software source code correlation. And just like any correlation, this is a general statistics term is zero for is correlation is zero for two things that are completely unrelated and one for things that are perfectly related. So the question is, how do we measure this for source code? Uh, and what I did is I found that instead of considering source code to be like a block of text, I said it needs to be divided into its various elements, the statements, comments, and strings, comments and strings because they're both non-functional. I lumped them together. Uh, identifiers, and then instruction sequence correlation. This was another new thing that had never been done before. What I said was somebody can change instructions, for example, or change comments. It's easy to change comments or strings. Someone can change the language of a user message, for example, or change the name of a variable or a function. And they can do all these. Oops, sorry. They can do all these, and still the program will work. And it's still we need to be able to detect that it was a, that it was the code was copied, but then these things were changed. 
And so if we look at each of these separately, strip out, you know, take out all the statements and just compare the statements, then take out all the comments and just compare the comments, take out all the identifiers and just compare the identifiers. But then what occurred to me is if somebody were so thorough that they changed all of these things, there still had to be something that was left that was the reason for their copying, and that's the instruction sequence. The idea is if you change everything, you still need to have the same sequence of instructions, otherwise your program's going to do something different. So I looked at all of these correlations and then I combined them into an overall correlation. Uh, and this shows the formula that I came up with. Basically, I, I gave some Greek variable names to uh, the correlations. And then the overall correlation at the bottom is basically just a four-dimensional distance. And it seems pretty straightforward, I think, but I have to tell you that I spent, that I spent, uh, I think, several years, at least a year, going through examples, taking open source code, comparing them, and looking at different correlation scores to figure out which combination of correlation scores brought all the copying to the top. In other words, the copied code had an overall higher correlation score. Uh, so there were, for example, you could add the correlation scores, you could average the correlation scores, you could give them a weighted average or a weighted sum. All of these things were things that I experimented with and wrote papers on. And finally, this, this simple distance turned out to give the best results. But now another thing missing from the other tools that were out there, and, and the, by the way, I was, at this time I was already doing work as a consultant to intellectual property litigation. And I found out that all these other tools couldn't be used in court. And one of the major reasons, a number of reasons, but one of them was that it didn't take into, into account why there could be correlation. So there could be correlation because there were there was third party source code. So in other words, if two programs had utilized the same open source code or the same library from Microsoft, there would be correlation even though they weren't copied. They could use automatic code generation tools that if these tools, if both programs generated code using uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, for example, they could be correlated, but not that was not copying. They can use commonly used elements where, you know, specific English language words, for example, that programmers use or words from the particular industry that programmers use. I had one case where uh, we found a very unusual identifier name in both programs. And I was ready to say that these, that this was uh, copied code when it turns out that some research uh, I just do some research and talking to the programmers, I discovered this word was a Hungarian word. And both sets of programmers of both companies were Hungarian. They're also common algorithms. So these are algorithms that are taught in school or in textbooks so that programmers would use these algorithms independently just because they had both learned these algorithms somewhere. And, and one of the most interesting ones is common author where the same programmer wrote two different programs, but wrote them completely independently. So let's say a programmer worked at one company, then left that company and went to another company and wrote code. And that programmer would have a style. For example, there are certain comments that he or she might use that would show up in both programs. It was not a sign of copying. It was a sign that this programmer liked to use those words or those comments or that style. So it's only after you can eliminate all of these other issues that you can determine that, it, that if there's still correlation, no matter how small the correlation, it can be a very small amount of correlation. But if you've eliminated all these other possible reasons, if there's any correlation, that means that copying will occur. So I created the Code Match program, which I sell through my company, Software Analysis and Forensic Engineering, also known as Safe Corporation. And here's how that program uses these 
these algorithms and allows a, a, an expert to uh, calculate correlation. So, let's see if I can do this. So, for detecting copyright infringement or trade secret theft in some cases, uh, you would take the original source code, compare it to the source code that's believed to have been copied, put it through the code match function of Code Suite. So, Code Suite is the tool that, that comprises all of the tools, uh, all of these forensic tools in one package. You put it through Code Match, and if there's correlation, that's a, a, an indication that you need to look further, but it's not an indication that copying occurred. What you need to do, the process involves running code match, running source detective. Source detective is another tool in Code Suite that searches the internet. It uses the Microsoft Bing search engine to search the internet and find out if any of the matching elements in both programs can be found on the internet. And then the user can say can decide to filter those out. So if it's a common term, a common programming term, if it's third-party code or open source code, the expert using using the tool will see that through Source Detective and then filter that out, generate a report. From the report, create further filters to filter out things that are not uh, signs of copying, maybe they're not copyright protected. Uh, again, they could be common elements, uh, common algorithms, filter that out and then continue to repeat steps three and four until nothing, until either there's no correlation anymore, it's zero, or you, there's nothing else to filter out. And if it's not zero at that point, it's uh, a sign that copying occurred. Now, just to be clear, uh, the, um, uh, the, the code match, rather than put out numbers between 0 and 1 for correlation, it just multiplies by 100 to make it easier to work with. So those correlation scores are between 0 and 100. And again, here's the, the filtering I just talked about. Also, sometimes there can be code that's not at issue. If this is a litigation, you can filter out things that are, you know, both parties have agreed is, are not at issue. Uh, and here, this shows a, a diagram of how the, the filtering goes. Basically, you filter out third-party code. A lot of this utilizes Source Detective to see if this code is on the internet. But a lot of this also requires just experience, an experienced expert running the tool. You look for code generation tools. Code generation tools will usually have a comment at the top saying this was generated by such and such a tool, by Microsoft Visual Studio. So that's a big clue that that file uh, is probably not a sign of copying. Uh, common elements, common algorithms, common authors. And again, if you get to the end, uh, then, uh, and you still have any kind of correlation, it's a sign that copying occurred. Then there's some other things uh, that, some other tools that uh, I'll talk about. Uh, source code cross-correlation. So this, this, I think, is interesting. I've been training. I've trained people worldwide on how to do this. I usually put together teams of people to work on litigations. And we kept running into a situation where we'd find commented out code. So code that was once functional, but somebody had turned it into a comment. And in some cases, that code came from another party. So, for example, if two companies are suing each other, we would find that once in a while, the company that was accused of copying would have the other party's code in their code, but as a comment. And what programmers do is they often take code, turn it into a comment so it doesn't work anymore, but use it as a reference to create new code. And that is copyright infringement, and it can be trade secret theft. And we found that so often that I actually define source code cross-correlation, which is a correlation between comments, between non-functional code and functional code. And the code suite tool that does that comparison is called, is called code cross. Then there's object code correlation, which is taking, well, the, the function that does this in code suite is called bitmatch. It takes in the source code, 
and some suspected copied object code. And again, it finds correlation. And what I'll say here is there have been cases where we don't have access to the other party's source code, but we can get the application itself, which is the binary object code, and compare source, for example, compare our client source code to the suspected copied code's object code. And we can still find correlation. And a lot of times this is necessary when a company wants to go to court for uh, because they suspect copyright infringement, they typically have to go to the court and say, here's why we suspect it. And it's very strong to say we suspect it because we found a correlation between our source code and their binary code. And then if the judge allows the case to move forward, then there'll be a process called discovery. And, and I'm sure many of you know this already, uh, so bear with me. I, I appreciate your continuing to, to tune in. Uh, but the judge will have will uh, set a period of discovery where then you can force each company to turn over its source code and do a full comparison using code match. But the other thing I'll say is that if you're using bitmatch, if you're doing object code correlation, if you find correlation in the object code, there's a very high probability that that object code came from copied source code. If you don't find anything, it could still be copied. When you turn source code into binary code, you lose so much information that the correlation is just not, uh, is not uh, as deterministic. So in other words, there are many false positives, but very, sorry, there are many false negatives, but there's almost no false positives. If you find correlation with binary code, it was probably copied. And then here's the, uh, you know, the representations with Greek letters, you know, for nice mathematical calculations. And then this just says, if you're going to use bitmatch, to find copying. It's the same kind of process as using code match. And here I'll, I'll talk about this. So people have asked me, where has this been used? And where has code match been used and source code correlation? So there've been a number of famous cases. I've personally used it in over a hundred cases. I've trained 50 some people worldwide. So I don't know how many cases they've used it in. Uh, but it's very rarely challenged anymore because it's passed every challenge, not just in the U.S. Well, here, here I'll go through these. These are the most significant cases that I'm aware of because I was involved with them. So Connect U v. Facebook was the case that was made into the movie The Social Network. If you haven't seen the movie The Social Network, I, I strongly suggest you see it. It's a great movie by my favorite screenwriter, Aaron Sorkin. It's about Mark Zuckerberg was accused of stealing the code for Facebook from uh, uh, students who were starting a similar project at when he was a student at Harvard. I was that was actually the first one of the very first uses of my tools and my process, and I was able to show that Mark Zuckerberg actually did not steal any code, uh, and so the case settled shortly after that. The issue was whether the, the students had a contract with him. So the students did get some money. He got very involved. And if you see the movie, The Social Network, you'll understand more. Again, a great movie. Our tools were used in Oracle America v. Google. This was a case that went up to the US Supreme Court. Unfortunately, I disagree with the US Supreme Court's decision in that case. Uh, you can read about that. I wrote an article about it, or maybe two articles or three. Uh, but our tools were used there. Serene Technologies v. Diori, Diura and Bandari was a lawsuit between an Israeli company and an Indian company. Uh, I was chosen by the court to be a neutral expert. And so both parties handed me over their source code. Uh, the company Diura and Bandari objected to me as an expert and my tools being used in the case. And they actually appealed my position as a neutral expert uh, up to the Indian Supreme Court. And the Indian Supreme Court said that I was qualified and my tools were uh, qualified to do the comparison. 
And then Suzu, Angela, the snail games. This was a, these are two large Chinese video game companies that sued each other for copy and code. And I was also selected as an expert in that case. Uh, interestingly enough, obviously I can't tell you what the results, well, the Connect UV Facebook was public and Mark Zuckerberg was not accused of stealing code. Oracle America v. Google, uh, I can tell you that Google copied code from Oracle, but for some reason the Supreme Court said it was a fair use. Fair use means that, yes, they copied it, but we're going to allow it. Uh, again, I don't understand that decision. Uh, Serene Technologies v. Dura and Banderi, I don't think the results were made public. But Suzu Angela and Snail Games, I, I can't tell you the results of that, but they ended up merging. So that was interesting. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is software clean room development. This is a little more controversial than it should be, I think. So software clean rooms have been around for decades, uh, but there was a book written in 1984 and it was never updated. So in my book, I updated the process. If you want to create software that mimics someone else's software, or if you the most common situation I see is where two companies have a partnership to use each other's software, and then one of the parties decides to terminate the partnership, and they need to recreate the other piece of software. The way you can do it legitimately without getting into trouble is to set up a clean room, a clean room process. So in the clean room process, you have a dirty room where anyone who has had contact with the original software that you're not allowed to copy they sit in that room and they describe the software at a very high level. Then they send those descriptions to a clean room consisting of programmers who've never seen the, the software that's being copied. They are building something from scratch based on these high level descriptions. But there's also an independent monitor. My company has acted as an independent monitor where we will watch the communications between the two and will act as a go-between. So any communication from the dirty room first goes to the monitor. The monitor looks at it, and if it spots anything that, that appears to violate the, to, to pass along intellectual property, proprietary intellectual property, it will stop that communication, go back to the dirty room and say, you need to take this information out. So for example, if the monitor sees specific lines of code or sees anything that uh, a, specific document that's proprietary it'll stop the communication and uh from going forward so so the so nothing gets to the clean room developers that they shouldn't see and the chances of them actually uh copying you know they it's it typically especially in copyright trade seek was a little more complex in copyright it's okay to copy concepts. It's just not okay to copy specific code. And so in this case, clean rooms are great for stopping copyright infringement. And if done carefully, they can stop trade secret misappropriation or trade secret theft. By the way, let me just, let me just go back to that. Uh, there, there has been some interesting, I've had some interesting uh, disagreements with some lawyers recently uh, about a clean room. And, what I realized is that a lot of companies don't want to go through a, a full clean room process. And some lawyers are advising them that you can, you don't have to go through the process. But my response to that is very strongly is that the clean room process will, will is the best way for avoiding any kind of intellectual property, claims of intellectual property theft or misappropriation in the future. You don't have to have a, a perfect clean room, um, but you want to try to have a perfect clean room. There are other ways of avoiding intellectual property misappropriation, but if you do a perfect clean room, you will, there's almost no chance that a litigation will succeed or that you've accidentally copied something. So the point is, you know, we all want to be perfect and sometimes we can't, but we should aim for that perfection is particularly in the case of the software clean room. So to summarize, I talked about US software copyright laws and trade secret laws, like a little typo there. 
I define source code, source code correlation, source code cross-correlation, uh, object code correlation, and a software cleanroom. And I want to thank you for the presentation, for allowing me to present this. And I, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, amazing presentation, actually.